Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York, 28th of February, 2007, approximately 10 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth? Webster Lansing Madison, Jr. Um, date of birth is February 2nd, or February 3rd, 1949. And uh, place of birth is Cambridge, New York. What was your educational background prior to entering service? I uh, graduated from Cambridge Central High School, and I have a two-year degree out of Hudson Valley Community College in construction technology. Okay. Um, were you drafted, or did you enlist? Uh, in the process of being drafted, so I enlisted. Okay. Um, why did you uh, select? You, you went into the army. Why did you select the army? Uh, don't know. <laughs> Had a chance to go in the Navy and the CVs because of my background in construction, but uh, selected for the Army, maybe because my father was in the Army. My two uncles were in the Army. <laughs> okay. When did you enter? I, I entered active duty on February 2nd, uh, 1970, is when I entered. Mm -hmm. And where did you enter the service? At uh, basic, well, Albany, New York, but ba basic training was down in uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Okay. How long were you at Fort Dix? Uh, through basic training, I think it's eight weeks plus one week of reception, so about nine weeks. Okay. Um, now you went into an engineering unit. Did, did you receive any specialized training? You had a, the two-year degree in construction did you right well receive? what happened was is I was working also as a carpenter prior to going into the service and uh, that was maybe what I was going to be in life I really didn't know at the time and um, I when I enlisted I enlisted for a carpenter school AIT at Fort Leonard Wood Missouri of which after basic training I went to uh, eight weeks of AIT at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and then uh, I got selected to go on to a senior carpenter course, which was uh, basically like an NCO academy, and that was, uh, I believe it was 18 weeks of training and six weeks of uh, on-the-job training. Uh, so after um, now, where was that? Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, right oh, there. Oh, that all was there. Right. Okay. So I, I, I went in. I, I, I come out of, of AI. Uh, come out of basic training as a E two, and out of AIT as an E two. But when I started up in my uh, secondary school, I started up as a spec four and come out as a spec five, and from from. The schooling I had in Fort Leonard, Missouri, I went home on leave and then right to Nam. Okay. You were assigned your unit when you got to Vietnam? After bouncing around for a couple of days, mm -hmm. uh, I finally got to the unit, 815th Engineers in Central Islands. Okay. Where did you land? Uh, Cameron Bay? Uh, no, no, down in, uh, in Benoit and then immediately went to Long Ben, was in Long Ben for uh, maybe one or two days, and mm -hmm. then they or two days, and then they shipped me up to the 35th group at Cameron Bay, and I was at Cameron Bay for in the 35th group for um, maybe three days, and then from there I got assigned to the 815th Engineers uh, out in the Central Islands. What were your impressions of when you first got off the plane into Vietnam? Well, it was, a, it was a little scary because as we were landing, they were talking about getting rocket attacks and uh, mortar attacks, uh, which I think it's just a standard they do. And they told us, you know, uh, once we hit the ground, if we come under fire, then crawl out, crawl across the tarmac and into the, you know, the uh, terminal, you know. And uh, kind of opened your eyes up for a second, right? But once I got to... Uh, Long Bend and, and saw the size of Long Bend. Long Bend was a huge, huge place, and uh, uh, you, you felt like a safety because you were you were in the middle of this big, huge army complex, and uh, 
uh, you didn't really see the outside, you didn't see Vietnam, you know, mm -hmm. what Vietnam was like at that time. Yeah. Now, when did you arrive in Vietnam? Did you say? Uh, uh, November, I believe it was November 22nd, 1970. Um, what were your impressions when you were arrived with your unit, when you first arrived there? When I was at Cameron Bay, uh, and uh, every day we would wake up and we'd have formation, and they'd call out numbers, and there'd be, you know, like 50 of us there, and uh, they'd, they, the Cameron Bay at the 35th Group, they'd be sending you to different engineering units throughout the uh, uh, Central Highlands, I believe, of uh, Vietnam, and uh, they kept telling us, uh, one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to have someone pick you to go to the 815th Engineers because it's out in the middle of nowhere, you sleep in tents, and uh, they have no PX facility but for, for, per se, and uh, uh, they get mortared a lot and they get hit a lot and stuff like that. And the worst place you could possibly go is the 815th Engineers, which uh, maybe on the second or third day they called my name out and that's where I was heading. So I, you know, I said, uh-oh. So, uh, and then uh, I can remember getting on the convoy leaving Cameron Bay and uh, yeah, the convoy, uh, it was 100, maybe, maybe 126 miles to, or 100 miles to, uh, to my unit uh, where I was going and it was an all day affair going on this convoy and we broke down a few times with flat tires and stuff and we never arrived at uh, Dillard which was the Camp Dillard 815th Engineers in the Central Islands until sometime, I'm guessing about 9 o'clock at night, it was at dark when we arrived there. And uh, Now when you were on the convoy, did you have a weapon? You, I, I think I was, I, I can't really remember, but I know mm -hmm. I was in the back of a deuce and a half, and I know as we were going up through the mountain pass one time, um, some of the some of the some of the guys they had a tarp there and some of the guys were hiding underneath the tarp and I said to myself well why why even bother you know and I I do I, I, I do believe maybe I was issued a temporary M16 at the time I'm not really sure if I did or not mm -hmm. but I know it was kind of, it was kind of like uh, you know going leaving Cameron Bay leaving the security of a large base also and going out on the road going through the villages on the way to Cameron Bay or on the way to Dillard and going up through this mountain pass, this huge mountain pass of uh, a lot of uh, hairpin turns in it, going up to the Central Highlands down from the lowlands down the coastal plains and near Fanrang Air Force Base. Uh, it, uh, it was quite eye-opening, it mm -hmm. was. Especially then it got dark and at night, and, you know. And uh, I can remember the first night at Dillard, when I got there, I signed in at nine, about 9 o'clock at night, I'm, I, I, I'm guessing. And I remember they put me in a tent, and I was in a tent and it was dark, and the tent just so happened to be just a few feet away from the, 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 the mortar pit. And the, mortar, the mortars, they had a couple of, I, I, they had a couple of 81 millimeters there, I think it was, and they were, they were putting off illuminations for the perimeter. And uh, I can remember hearing the first few rounds going out, and I remember rolling off my, my cot, underneath my cot, wondering what the hell's going on here and having a guy that was already in country that had transferred some way and he said that's outgoing, that's not incoming. So I kind of learned quick on that what outgoing sound mm -hmm. like compared to incoming. Yeah, that was, uh, that sticks in my mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now you lived in a tent the whole time you were there? Yes, except the time I was traveling and mm -hmm. uh, I, I lived, um, you know, just slept on a cot or slept on the, the back of the gun truck. Now, what were your duties while you were there? When I first got to Dillard in D Company, uh, 815th Engineers, uh, we, we, what the, the, the job of the 815th Engineers was is to uh, reconstruct uh, a section of highway called QL20 that led from basically maybe Saigon up to the city of Delat, and the city of Delat in the Central Highlands was like 
I'm guessing it was like the vegetable capital of South Vietnam. There was a lot of uh, vegetables grown there, the tomatoes, the onions, the lettuce, um, uh, and uh, it was quite a trade going back and forth. And I think what, why we were there is to improve the, help improve the economy of the peop for the people and help improve the road. The road was an uh, 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 older road that uh, it was paved in some places. It was broken up. It need it need uh, widening. It need uh, 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 paving and it need uh, proper drainage. And the, the the job of the 815th engineers is to reconstruct about I think about 30 kilometers of that road. And then down below us would be another engineering unit, and they had 30 kilometers to do all the way. And, and it was all the way down from the, the city to lot all the way down through to Saigon. Uh, they were trying to, to repave this road, re reconstruct this road. And the first month that I, w about the first month I was there, um, I was uh, in a squad that we put in um, culverts in the road, uh, hand dug the, 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 the ditches, uh, put the culvert in and built the head walls on the culverts, or um, Sometimes just just general road maintenance. I I didn't work as a carpenter at the time really. It was just a laborer on the road. And uh, after about a month of that, um, the tent that I was in was was uh, I was like the squad leader for uh, the uh, other people in the tent. And it was an eight-man tent, and there was five or six people in there, including myself. And the majority of them in there were uh, members of a what they called a gun truck. It's, it, 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 and that's what I ended up being the squad leader of, the NCYC of this gun truck. It was a uh, five-ton cargo truck that was, uh, that was modified and, uh, with armor plating and uh, with machine guns on it. And now, how was it modified? In what ways were it well, plating? Well, the, the, uh, a, a gun truck... A gun truck was um, was a hybrid, non-authorized military vehicle that the, the United States military didn't have any per se. But what ha what happened is about 1967 uh, convoys, supply convoys, getting ambushed a lot. Uh, the defenses they had was people just riding shotguns in the trucks with their M16s or the 79s or, or maybe uh, M60 machine guns, um, and uh, they they had they got enough in enough ambushes where they needed a hardened what they called a hardened truck, and the, uh, a colonel in the Eighth Group Transportation um, started modifying, taking trucks, cargo trucks, the deuce and a halves originally, and modifying them by putting sandbags up in the boxes and, and, and placing uh, the American soldiers in there with machine guns. And that eventually led to uh, putting um, uh, armor plating on the backs of the trucks and mounting machine guns in it, and th thus the birth of what they called the gun truck. And, and the gun truck started taking names on, uh, such as um, such as the uh, the steel art in in <coughs> World War II uh, of the uh, B-52 bombers had the the pinup girls or or different slogans on them. Gun trucks started uh, uh, becoming uh, 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 used in Vietnam, and they weren't really authorized by the United States government, and they, they were were not a a government. <coughs> issued vehicle, but the GIs themselves build it. And the gun truck that I eventually come on after about a month of being out on the road, uh, they needed another gunner on this truck uh, because of problems they had. And uh, one gunner left, so they, so they asked me, because I had an interest in it, because I was a squad leader of the people that was on this truck, and I had an interest in machine guns and stuff like that. And, uh, I ended up uh, becoming on the truck, and I served about 11 months on the truck. And um, when I got on the truck, uh, it had a it was a five-ton cargo that had a, 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 a small armored box on it, 
and it was mounted with different machine guns. And, and after I got on the truck and talking with the, the veterans that were on the truck with me that had prior service on there, uh, we decided to modify the truck by uh, extending, extending the size of the box and, and adding more armament and, and more machine guns on the truck. And uh, that's what I ended up doing for 11 months uh, is uh, riding convoy security uh, on, on supply convoys in this armored truck that uh, was called the Wild Thing. It was a um, five-ton cargo that had been modified with uh, machine guns on it. It had an Arkansas Razorback on the side, painted on the side. Someone from Arkansas, I can't find out who, painted down there and named it the Wild Thing. And uh, that's what I did uh, for 11 months when I was in Vietnam. Now, now did you have uh, 50 calibers on that or M60s? We, well, when I first got on the gun truck, we had 160 on the front of the box. Mm -hmm. We had 250s on each side mounted. And, and the mounts, uh, the, the mounts, what, 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 we would go to the motor pool to the uh, uh, the welders and, and if we needed a mount welded or something like that. We, this Everything was modified ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I got on the truck and uh, the box was extended, we increased the armament. Uh, we happened to have a uh, minigun, uh, which we mounted on the originally on the back of the truck. And we had two 50s, and then we, we doubled up on the 60s. So uh, it, in, the, in the end, the total armament on the gun truck was a, a minigun, two 50s, and two M60 machine guns mounted together uh, in dual. And uh, we carried uh, our M16s with us. We carried uh, 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 M79 grenade launcher with us, and we carried um, one of the guys carried a 45. I myself carried. I had a little M1 M M2 carbine that was cut down that I carried. It was an unauthorized uh, uh, weapon that I had with me, but it's just just another backup. And we carried thousands and thousands of rounds of for for the M16, for the the 50 caliber, for the uh, the the uh, the minigun in the in the uh, M60s fired exactly the same, 7.62 round, and uh, we carried uh, 100 rounds of uh, the 79, and uh, that's what I did. If this was unauthorized, where did you get the plating? Where did you get all the weapons? Uh, the we the uh, what? I can't really say it was unauthorized. Mm -hmm. It was just like it was accepted. Mm -hmm. it, it, I had a really good it, it, gun trucks. We had we had um, seven or eight of them in my unit, and we would take turns going on. Uh, um, um, we'd take turns going on different convoys, little supply convoys, up to the city of the lot, or down to Cameron Bay, or down to Long Bend. I went there quite a bit, or to different other engineering units to swap. Uh, 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 equipment and pick up supplies and, and, and uh, new people coming in or whatever. And uh, of the seven or eight gun trucks that we had in my unit, there was no two that was alike. There, it, there was, you know, everything is usually standard in the military. They had the same, like, like another gun truck uh, might, uh, there was another gun truck called uh, Terry's Terrible Roach Coach that was with, uh, I think it was C Company. I was with D Company, and uh, they had just like uh, maybe two M60 machine guns mounted in the back of the truck with different type of, of armor plating. The armor plating we got, we went to the motor pool and asked for it, and they had you know sheets of armor plating, and they you know, and, and one thing really it was really neat about the whole thing of the whole setup that I had after I was uh, got on this gun truck is I found out that the 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 up, upper brass of the my unit, the first sergeant or, 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 or my, my commanding officer, the CO, uh, who was from Buffalo, by the way, uh, Captain Chu. Um, and, and the colonel, the sergeant major, anybody above me uh, almost let me have a, a, a free hand in, in, in this thing. 
And if I wanted, like I had, I, I, I wanted to, when I doubled up on the, on the M60 machine guns, I, wanted, I, I, I went to the motor pool and I had them make two mounts together that would swivel together. Uh, and, and, and then I, I went to the armor, we had an armor, and, and I said, I need another M60 machine gun. And he said, well, I don't really know. He kind of like balked at it, you know. So all I did is I turned around and I walked in and I said to Top, I says, you know, I says, uh, I'd like to put another 60 on the truck. He says, go get it. Basically that. So anything, anything that I ever, you know, I ever did, I had like a free hand of doing and, and ran a tight ship and um, did, did the job and did it well and uh, uh, they, didn't, they didn't mess with me, you know. Um, and anything I needed. The, uh, the, the M60 machine, I mean the, the minigun that we had mounted, uh, we got from a special forces unit when my unit uh, E-15th was up north, so I've been told. They was up around the Contoon Play Cooey area and they got this minigun that really wasn't in very good working condition and on one of the convoys down to Cameron Bay we had the parts to the minigun and we stopped in at Fanrang Air Force Base which they had, uh, the, the minigun is, is a uh, helicopter or a aircraft uh, machine gun and um, the people at Fanrang Air Force Base had, uh, the security police had miniguns mounted on um, jeeps and they ran uh, 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 their perimeter at night with, with uh, miniguns on their jeeps and, and uh, presented it to them and they said we'll help you so the, the, uh, <coughs> the Air Force people at Fanrang Air Force Base uh, helped me, helped us, not just myself, helped, helped the, the crew, myself and the crew, set up the minigun and uh, gave us parts and uh, set the whole thing up on our uh, on our truck. And uh, uh, there was the we were the only truck that I ever saw in Vietnam that had a minigun on it, a gun truck. But there was many other ones. I'm finding out now. There's ma there was many other ones that had uh, different different uh, some some. Uh, some of your gun trucks had like four four miniguns mounted on them, and uh, so I, anything I ever needed, I, I usually got with uh, without much of an argument. Now, how many were uh, were in your crew on, on the truck and on a convoy? How many were on your truck? Uh, <laughs> the, the, I had the I had a driver, the driver of the truck, of course, and then myself and two other gunners. Uh, once in a great while, we had a third gunner, um, but not very often. A fourth gunner, not very often. Did the crews generally remain the same? Well, see, that's that's one of the uh, one of the one of the things that I I kind of like stressed upon uh, on, on on my first sergeant and my captain is uh, they wanted to start switching people around and stuff like that, and uh, the the the, the the crew that, that I had, uh, people, of course, coming and leaving quite a bit, but generally, for the most period, we had almost the same crew. Uh, there were three different drivers, but uh, in 11 months, three different drivers wasn't too bad. And, and I had a couple different uh, gunners, but m mostly we had the gun truck crew. And, and, and what happened was is, is when they, they started saying, well, have one guy in charge and then, then in, in formation in the morning, uh, such as other gun trucks had sometimes, they'd say, well, okay, you two guys are going to ride the gun truck today, and you two guys will do it tomorrow and stuff like that. And I, and I, I basically sat down with my first sergeant and, and maybe even the captain, I'm not really sure at the time, uh, when they wanted to switch things around, and, and I said, listen, I says, you know, you, you, you've got like a football team, you've got a quarterback and you've got some... Uh, uh, a line and you've got the, the running backs and we operate as a team and we've practiced as a team. Uh, every Sunday morning we cleaned our weapons. That was the, was the you get up and you strip down the, the machine guns and you cleaned them and you put them back up and then uh, say like the 50s you had to time, you had a, you had a head space and time them. Everything after everything was all cleaned and everything We'd go out and uh, cross the street from our unit, my unit in the rock quarry that they had, and we would test fire our machine guns. And everybody on the truck 
was familiar with where the ammunition was, uh, how to fire each weapon, how to time each weapon, um, stuff like that. So we operated as a team. Uh, so I think that's one reason why maybe we, uh, I thought we were good, you know, because of that reason. Now you said you had a video of your gun truck doing that, firing in the rock quarry? N no, I have a, I have a, 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 a friend of mine uh, taped back in 19, May of 71, I believe, he had a little cassette recorder and he taped the firing of the mm -hmm. minigun mm -hmm. and the M79s and just the test firing mm -hmm. that we had. And there was other people there also. Mm -hmm. And and I have a I have a I have a CD of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is able to reproduce it and, and uh, I have a I believe a copy that you can have or something. Okay. How often did you guys come under attack or fire on the convoys? I I myself um, not a lot. And, 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 I, and I, I think, I think the reason why, to, to be truthful about it, is that an engineering unit building a road, we were there building a road that eventually the NVA, the Viet Cong, they used that road also. And, and eventually they knew that that was going to be their road mm -hmm. in the end. They knew that. And we kind of like knew it too, you know. So we we didn't get we didn't get um, we didn't get in a lot of ambushes. I got I, I was sitting out on the road one night because a roller broke down, and I was waiting for a crane to come out and pick up the the roller and put it on a low boy and take it back to the unit. And it was at seven. Was that I, they called me out of the mess hall. It's maybe seven o'clock at night, and I sat up on the edge of the the gun truck. Uh, I can remember eat, eat, eating some sea rations, even after I'd come from the mess hall. And uh, I remember sitting up there and uh, I turned and I saw the crane and the, 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 uh, the jeep coming down the road towards where we sat and all of a sudden, boom, boom, and the, the, uh, the jeep got lifted off the ground and come back down and it got hit by two RPGs, I think hit underneath it. and. Uh, Quickly, we spun around and returned, fired, and went up and picked up the guys and left the area. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as coming, uh, that was w one of the ambushes that I sat right there and watched the whole thing. And you know, they they could have knocked us off just as easy, you know, but they didn't. Um, but the 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 convoys got once in a while got harassment fire, and we got harassment fire once in a while, but not a lot where we were. Not a lot. Uh, at the, the, sometimes at night, when they would they would drill in the quarry at night, we'd have to go out there and we'd have to uh, pull guard duty at night, a gun truck, while the men worked the drilling in the rock quarry. They got hit a few times out there, and we got you know, just harassment fire here and there. Sometimes I think that uh, some of the harassment fire we got was from the Arvins, to tell mm -hmm. you the truth. They they uh, they screwed with us on the road quite a bit. You know, they shot over our heads and stuff. Um, after I had gotten off the truck and got come home, the person, one of, one of, the, one of the, the, the GIs that I trained to take over my spot, uh, a few uh, soon afterwards, after I got home, I got a let, I got a letter, and uh, he had got shot in an ambush. They got ambushed down uh, on the way back to Longbin, and he got uh, shot down around the groin area. Uh, the bullet come through the windshield, and there was only one spot. There wasn't armor plating on the box of the gun truck and that one spot was right behind the driver so the so when I was behind the minigun or the person behind the minigun uh, would be in radio contact with the convoy commander constantly you know uh, as the uh, as the convoy was going down the road and I'd have to have communications with the driver so uh, without a headset or anything like that we didn't have these I'd have to put my head down into the cab of the truck and yell at the driver, you know, speed up, slow down, or go around him, or, you know, do this or do that. And the bullet come through the windshield and hit him, hit him down around the groin area. And that was Tommy Pruitt, his name was, uh, from Oklahoma, and he's, uh, uh, he, he, uh, he received the Purple Heart, and he's the guy who that, that took my spot in Vietnam. Mm -hmm.
So I guess I got out of there just in time. And that's, uh, we were shutting down at the time. My unit was shutting down with no longer building the road. We were, uh, they were shutting the unit down at the time. And that's when the most, the most harassment fire was coming about then. Um, I guess, uh, did you, what did you think of the uh, Vietnamese army itself then? You, did you have much contact with them? I, I had, I had a, a lot of, uh, I had quite a bit of contact with uh, some of the Arvins that, um, that pulled uh, uh, like guard duty along the road that we, we worked on. Um, there was uh, there was a bunch that were in a what they call a V100, which was a um, an armored uh, vehicle, and um, I can remember sitting and eating with them quite a bit and trying to talk to them. I knew I know a little bit of Vietnamese. Um, they needed some supplies, like some flares and stuff like that. I remember giving them some flares and. They traded some other stuff for I can't remember what I got, you know, from just trinkets or something like that. But uh, some of them I met were, were some of some of the Arvins that I met and talked to, and like this, I can remember this one one person. Uh, I seemed to like and stuff like that, and felt sorry for him. But the the other there's some of the Arvins that you know they when when we go down the road on convoy uh, after going by them. They would actually fire over our heads. They would they would pick up their M16s and they'd fire them just to watch us jump. You know, it's a very touchy situation when you're going down on a convoy. You never know when you're going to get hit because you're always on the defense. You never you know you're out, you're, you're never on the offense. You're always on the defense. And uh, I can remember going and complaining to my colonel about uh, about this being harassed by by the South Vietnamese Army, the, the Arvins themselves. Uh, they do it as a joke. They fire in the air overhead just to watch us jump, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, and I and I, I didn't like it. Didn't like it at all. But uh, it, 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 I had the feeling that just as we pulled out of Vietnam, that it would fall. Put it that way. Yeah. I had that feeling. Did you have a lot of flat tires with your vehicles? Uh, that, uh, when we went on. Um, on convoys, uh, quite a bit uh, of, of flat tires. I, uh, quite a bit. Um, the the um, tractor trailers, especially for some reason, the low boys, mm -hmm. they'd have flat tires, and you know we uh, we carried spare tires in the back of our gun truck, in the very back of it, we carried uh, two or three. And yeah, I, I think the tires, uh, not being a mechanic or anything like that, but, uh, military tires weren't the best built in the world, I guess. <laughs> Right. Now, did you have to make any modifications? Were there any modifications to the engine because you were putting so much weight in the back of these? No, 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 no. It, 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 that, that, that's an interesting uh, subject you brought up because the um, the original Wild Thing gun truck, the the uh, the armored box was a double walled box that were f was filled with sand and capped off with concrete. It was about. I'm guessing about six or seven inches thick, and it was it was it was a smaller box, and it was originally on a deuce and a half, two and a half ton cargo truck. And when I got to Vietnam, it was on a five ton cargo. The five ton cargo truck that the Wild Thing was built on when I got on it. The box was taken off a deuce and a half and put on a five ton cargo. And the reason why, first of all, my unit was not authorized a five ton cargo truck. But I was told that a warrant officer four, who was in charge of the motor pool, when he was down in Cameron Bay one time, he spotted a five ton cargo, brand new one, there. And when they left, to go back to Dillard, that five ton cargo was back at Dillard and he was responsible for taking off the box off the, the deuce and a half and putting it on the five ton cargo 
because it's a bigger, more powerful uh, uh, truck. And the reason why is because of the weight and, and also the mountain passes that we had to go through was quite a bit of chore for the deuce and a half to do that. And, and, and we were not authorized a five ton cargo, but we had a five ton cargo and that ended up being the gun truck. And so the gun truck could keep up with everything else. And, and, and that's why it become a five ton cargo. Originally it was on a deuce and a half. Mm -hmm. And how it was, I often was told that the five ton cargo, which was the only one in my unit, was uh, borrowed. And that's how we ended up with it. Were, uh, no, while you were there, you were there in 70, 71, did uh, you have any problems with drugs inside your unit at all? Or? The, uh, the, 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 The drugs that I saw in Vietnam would scare you. I saw many GIs uh, taking uh, heroin. Uh, basically, there was a, there was a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, of um, marijuana, heroin, and uh, I believe it was opium. Uh, the main thing was the uh, the heroin and heroin come in little tiny vials, little tiny things about the size of a thimble you use in sewing. And I can remember you would see uh, you would see if you'd go out and walk the perimeter wire uh, from the tents. And this is where a lot of these vials were discarded. And you could go out there and you could just walk and you'd see these empty vials and you would see hundreds of them. And my unit, in my unit, there was a, there was quite a few people that were heroin addicts, and uh, that kind of like affected me sometimes because um, once in a great while we had a we had a little landing pad in LZ um, for medevac helicopters that was outside the compound, out uh, the main gate, and it was a it was a helipad, and every once in a while at one or two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. They'd wake me up to take the gun truck out and stand by, pull guard for a chopper coming in to medevac out a uh, person who had uh, OD'd on heroin. But uh, I saw I saw quite a bit of I saw quite a bit of heroin over there. Yes. But were there any problems, racial problems within your unit? Absolutely, absolutely. There there was there was there was a lot. There was a lot. Um, uh, and I really hate to say this, but there was times that I thought we'd have a race riot. And, and once or twice I can remember sleeping in the box of the gun truck that sat outside my tent. So I'd be more secure because I thought there was going to be a race riot. And it, it was preached. It was preached to us. What yeah. do you mean preached to you? It was preached that, well, I, I heard more than once I heard that if we, you know, if we got in a firefight, uh, there would be not only if we got the main firefight on the compound that there would be um, there would be maybe at the same time people being shot from basically one I gotta say is from the back you know what I mean there was uh, racial tensions there quite a bit and I saw it in the mess hall and stuff like that I saw you know uh, racial tensions there was there was a lot of it at the time and it seemed to um, at, at, what I saw, it didn't seem to, it didn't, uh, I, it, the, the higher brass didn't seem to take care of it. And, um, but I, I saw quite a bit of, I saw quite a bit of that, yes I did. Did you have any black crew members uh, with, with your truck? No, no, no I did not. Okay. Do you know if any of those trucks were, were saved or preserved or? Uh, sent back to the states, or y yes, yes. Um, there, there, uh, the, there was estimated between three and four hundred of these trucks that were modified trucks in Vietnam. One of them, called the Eve of Destruction, was brought back his original truck. Mm -hmm. uh, some of my friends that I've been in contact with, one person down in Tennessee, a very good friend of mine, is, uh, was the NCOIC of that truck. And that truck was brought back and preserved, and that truck is in uh, the uh, 
Military Transportation Museum at Fort Eustis, Virginia, and I went and saw that truck this last summer. I traveled with that truck. How is that different than your truck? Uh, d different type of armor plating on the side, different type of machine guns. Uh, I mean, they, they had, uh, uh, I, think, I think the EVA Destruction had uh, all 50s on it. I think there was four 50s on it, two that were in tandem, two double, double twin 50s, and then two single 50s. Uh, they didn't have a minigun, but they, you know, they, I'm sure they carried their M16 with them and their 79s and stuff like that. Some, some tr gun trucks carried uh, uh, shotguns with them. I never saw a shotgun in Vietnam, if I can remember right. But uh, yes, the original there's an original one down in uh, in uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia. When did you leave Vietnam? I left Vietnam uh, November 21st or 22nd of 1971. When did you? Uh, when were you discharged? Uh, the army. Mm -hmm. um, after I got back from Vietnam, I, uh, I asked for extended leave and I was home for like um, 45 days plus eight days, eight, eight day travel days or something like that. So I was home for quite a long period of time and my next duty station was um, in Fort Lewis, Washington, of which I went out to Fort Lewis. I enlisted for three years and by the time I got back from Vietnam, uh, because I went in at, in about, uh, it was uh, February 2nd, and by the time I got to Fort Lewis, Washington, it was uh, somewhere in the middle of January of 72. I had almost one year left on my uh, commitment of three years, and I was at Fort Lewis, Washington for only about two to three weeks, if I can remember right, when um, a fellow GI told me about uh, President Nixon wanting to cut back troop strength and that if I had just got back from Vietnam, I had didn't have any Article 15s under my belt, uh, good behavior, the whole nine yards, that I could swap any time I had left remaining as active duty for uh, the same amount of time in the uh, National Guard. Uh, so I went to see some type of a recruiter in uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, of which he set me up with uh, the uh, National Guard in Hoosier Falls and got me in. And I was only out there about three weeks and I come home and I spent a, a year of active duty in the National Guard in replacement for a year of active duty uh, in the United States military, uh, regular army. So f you then so in 72, then you went into the Guard until 73, and that's when you left Yes, service. yes, and I'm not too sure what time, uh, what, what my, my, you know, that, that was, uh, that, that was quite a thing. You come home from Vietnam, and you got still a year left, and they, you, they ship your way out to Fort Lewis, Washington, which is <laughs> on the other side of the world from here, and uh, uh, to swap a year of active duty for a year to go home and become uh, National Guard, uh, it was well worth it, and uh, uh, fortunate that it happened to me. And I can't remember when exactly I was discharged from the uh, National Guard a year later, I guess. What uh, basically did you do with the National Guard? What type of, uh, what were your duties? Uh, the, the, uh, the National Guard down in Hoosick Falls was the armored unit. And I can't, rem I can't remember the, the uh, type of tanks that we were involved in. Um, I went to... Uh, um, the regular meetings they had once a month, a weekend a month, and then I spent two weeks up to Camp Drum mm -hmm. in training. And uh, while I was there in Camp Drum, um, we did go out on the firing range and use the uh, secondary weapon that I was on the tank, and that was a 50 caliber, which I'm very familiar with. And uh, I was just a regular, regular person in the National Guard at the time, uh -huh. put it that way. Now, were you aware of the anti-war movement? Oh, oh, yes. Yes, I was. Before I left and then... Mm -hmm. Did you have any time. problems at all when you came back? Uh, I, I, yes, I, I had a, a... Well, 
a little bit of a problem. First of all, growing up in Cambridge, New York, and my father and both my uncles being World War II veterans, uh, my father's, um, uh, most of my father's friends were World War II veterans. So I grew up in a community where a lot of my older people that I was surrounded by were World War II veterans. And uh, I knew them well. And uh, so when I got home, the, the older people, the World War II veterans, accepted me hands down. It was, it was great. I was, uh, you know, I was taking up the American Legion and become a member. And uh, uh, I, I was treated with respect. There's no question in my life. Uh, some of the younger people um, my age, um, I, one time I was dating, uh, briefly dating a school teacher, and her and her friend uh, once in a while would say to me, well, why didn't you go to Canada? Why didn't you, 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 you know, skip out on the draft and stuff like that? And uh, I, in a, in a few cases, in a few barroom discussions, I got in heated arguments over the, the why I should have been in Vietnam or why I shouldn't have. And I, I ran to Gauntlet in that. Not a lot, but enough so it irked me, put it that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. uh, when you came back, then you did join a, a veterans group? Yes, I did. Yeah, and were you active at all in it? Not, no, not very active. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, I, I don't like, uh, I don't join up groups and become very, I've been some active in the American Legion. I, I've, I've worked at some of their banquets. I used to sell the bingo tickets and stuff like that. But I'm not very active. I don't like commitments like that. I'm, I'm basically, uh, I have my own commitment to myself and my family and uh, that's my number one commitment. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, how about with, uh, I know you've been active recently with, with the gun trucks and could you talk about that a little bit? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's kind of an interesting thing. Back a, a handful of a few years ago, I got a phone call from a, a person that I really didn't know, and uh, it didn't ding, ring a bell. But uh, there's a person by the name of Randy Reck, Randall Reck, who lives in uh, out in Indiana, and he called me up and he says, "You, you, you maybe not remember me. He was in my unit in Vietnam, and." Uh, he was a um, he was a truck driver that that drove a supply truck and the supply truck he had the name I'm not happy on that and um, he was also a part time mechanic in the motor pool I guess and he helped modify some of the like the exhaust system on the gun truck the exhaust pipe on a five ton cargo comes up the side of the truck and uh, I was constantly eating uh, diesel fumes from the exhaust pipe and I wanted it modified so it would be turned down and go underneath the truck and he's one of the, the people that uh, modified it, uh, helped modify it and turn it down so I wouldn't have to eat that uh, diesel smoke all the time. And um, what happened was is that he had quite a few photographs of uh, us being on convoy. He was always on convoy with us and he used to party with us and stuff like that. and. Uh, he had pictures of this gun truck, uh, the wild thing, and it was kind of a unique truck. And uh, he was showing it to a. Uh, he had some pictures that his brother had, who had a friend of a friend who ended up a, a historian in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, who was a non-veteran, but uh, his name is John Patangelo. He wanted to build something for. Uh, the uh, Vietnam veterans, and uh, what he did, he saw pictures of the gun truck, fell in love with it, and he uh, he basically went out and bought a five-ton cargo, and he th threw photographs that myself and a few other people had sent him through this contact with Randy Reck. Uh, he recreated this the gun truck, the wild thing. And it's a traveling museum, and he uh, did a excellent job of of, of recreating the 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 the, the uh, 
Arkansas Razorback that's painted on the side of it, the lettering on it, and it, it's the most perfect uh, replica of the gun truck that I was on in Vietnam. The gun truck I was in in Vietnam is no longer in existence. It was left over there, no one knows even where it goes. But uh, what, what John Patangelo did is spend uh, thousands and thousands of dollars of his own money and recreated this gun truck of which um, I now go and, uh, and travel with. It's in the museum. It's in, it's in the Heritage, the Victory uh, Heritage Museum in Angola, Indiana. And uh, it's housed there, but we can go in and take it out and we travel through different areas of the United States. It's been to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, to the Army War College there. Uh, it's been to uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia for uh, 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 exhibit. It's been to Branson, Missouri to a uh, Vietnam re reunion. It's been to um, uh, Wapakoneta, Ohio to a Vietnam uh, reunion there. It's been to Kokomo, Indiana. We travel throughout Basically, we've traveled throughout the United States with this recreated model of the gun truck. The driver who drives the replica of this gun truck was the driver that I had in Vietnam. He lives about an hour and a half away from where it's housed in this mm -hmm. museum. Um, the, uh, the person that really runs it now is Randy Reck, who uh, served with us in Vietnam. He's very familiar with the truck, and he, he's, he, he sets up the uh, different shows that we take it to now. And uh, we've had a reunion, and uh, the first reunion was dedicated to the museum out in uh, Auburn, Indiana. Uh, myself, uh, who, who I served for 11 months on the truck, the truck in, in Vietnam only lasted for about three years of that. And I, I guess maybe I, I served more time than anybody else on the original gun truck. But uh, also we had a, a gunner that I had, Tommy Norris, out of Natchez, Mississippi. He was there. I've been in contact with him. Uh, the driver, Dar Sanders from uh, Eau Claire, Michigan, who drove the original truck. Uh, he, he drives the truck now. Randy Reck from Fremont, Indiana, uh, who was with us in Vietnam. Uh, and then we had another uh, uh, friend of mine, his name was Randy Kennard, who has since passed away, but he was with our reunion, and he rode me a couple times on the gun truck as a gunner on the 50 caliber. And um, it's it's quite a uh, it's quite a, an honor for uh, uh, John Tangelo and his family to uh, build and, and and turn this over to us to use this. Uh, uh, my hats go off to the man for doing it. He's he's, he's done a lot for us. How do you think your time in Vietnam changed or had an effect on your life? Well, uh, I don't, I, 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 I really, well, been there and done it. I'm not a wannabe, mm -hmm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, don't know. Uh, in keeping up with the tradition of my, my father and my two uncles, uh, the, um, there's four Madison names on the monument in Cambridge, and uh, I don't think there's any other family has that many. And I guess it's like a family, it was like a family tradition. Um, hopefully my son will never have to go to war, put it that way. I, I don't like war. Uh, how it's changed my life, I don't. I, you know, I, I guess there's pluses and there's minuses. In it, you know. Now, do you have some photographs of the gun truck? Yep. Y yes, I do. Yeah, just uh, roll them out. Well, yeah, if you okay. hold them up like this uh, uh, in front of you, Wayne can focus right in on it. Okay. You just hold it up in front of you. All right. Well, th what, I, what I have is a photograph of myself in Vietnam in 71, <coughs> and then on the recreated replica, okay. and uh, okay, that's that's you in '71. That's me in '71. It's a minigun. Um, this guy right here is Darwin Sanders. He was my driver, and this guy is Donald Tanner. He's behind a 50. He was from Louisiana. Okay. I, 
can't find him. I've tried very hard to find him. Um, Darwin Sanders, uh, I'm in contact with constantly. Uh, this is the replica down here that John Patangelo built. Uh, the minigun and myself, I'm behind it. And then if you look back here, you can barely see that's Darwin Sanders, the same guy here. We did, uh, I kind of like tried to recreate some of the photographs. Mm -hmm. And this photograph here was taken out of the uh, out of the eight um, fifteenth album that I had. Um, okay. Okay. This is a picture of the looking down into the box of the truck in seventy one. Okay. Uh, the minigun, two fifties and two sixties, and. Trying to recreate the same thing with the minigun. This is the the replica. Uh, a little difference in the the armor, the original box. Like I said before, the original box was smaller, mm -hmm. and this is the double walled with the sand in between with the concrete pack. Okay. When we extended the box to make it bigger for more room and put the minigun up front, uh, the extended box is only of about, I guess it was half inch, maybe five eighths inch uh, uh, armor plating that was added to it. And John Patangelo apparently didn't have this photograph until after he built the box and he knew the box was, so the recreated model is not quite accurate, but good enough. Now where was uh -huh. the Razorback painted? Huh? Is that it there? Or yeah, I, yeah, I have some place I have. Yeah. Okay, right. I've been trying to find the guy, I'm assuming, from Arkansas. This is a picture taken at what we call the car wash. It was outside my unit and uh, in Dillard in QL20 in the Central Highlands. And this is the original, original truck um, with the Arkansas Razorback painting on the side of it. And this is the recreated model. The, this is the clone that... Uh, John Patangelo that I travel with now. Uh, a remarkable resemblance. When I, uh, when they first showed me this truck, I traveled out to uh, Fremont, Indiana, and I was standing in the back door yard after being there about a day. They wouldn't show me the truck. And after everybody gathered together, I was standing right next to the owner of the truck uh, who, who built it, John Patangelo. And, uh, the truck was hidden away from me in a, in a big garage and, and they presented the truck, they were going to present the truck to myself and to the, the other gunners that were there at this reunion. None of us had seen it yet. And when they started the truck up, there's the distinct whine of a five-ton cargo truck that you'll never forget. It's a whine. And um, I heard that start up and the tears started to come. Well, when they drove down the road, I couldn't see only bits and pieces of the truck, but then when the truck turned and come in in front of me, I was standing next to the uh, the owner, John Patangelo, and um, I took one look at the side of the truck, and this, this photograph was taken right during then, and I saw the Arkansas Razorback there. It was the most perfect, identical spitting image of the original one. Um, my knees buckled, uh, tears come to my eyes, and I had to walk away, and I walked behind the garage and lost it because it brought back the memories, you know. Yeah. I tried to extend my time in Vietnam to stay with that truck. I didn't want to leave that truck. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let me. I tried to extend for six months in Vietnam, but they wouldn't let me. Try to take it home? Huh? I, I, you know, I, if, I, if I could, I would have. <laughs> Put it that way. Right. <coughs> right. There's a there's just a picture. That's a that's a typical day, going down the road in Vietnam. That's a picture of myself behind the minigun, that, and that picture was taken in Vietnam. The flak jacket, helmet on. Do you wear the flak jacket all the time? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Once once I once in a while maybe you know, but it was standard SOP. You know, we had helmet and flak jacket. Once in a while we didn't have our helmet on, but most of the time we did. 
Okay. And I'm a, this, this, oh, I can't. Uh, I don't know if that picture was taken down near Fane Ring, down the lower coastal. It might have been, might have been up where we were. You see that there's a little mountain there, but not, no. We were like on a high plateau, but we were up in the mountains, definitely. I don't know where that picture was taken. Okay. Okay. All right. I've got about two minutes. Okay, well, I'm done. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Webb. Yep. Would you want to copy those?